Hello, and welcome back to Let's Play True to Grad with me, Bring It On. So I'm gonna go ahead and give Hexagen. Oh, we can't use either one of these. He has eight intellect. And he needs less than four. Well, darn. That sucks. But we also didn't finish allocating his skill points last episode, so let's take care of that. I think we're gonna grab self-sufficient, oh no, sorry, um, in a reserve for more health. And then we're gonna give him a uh, fast learner, get plus one skill point for every level. Can't go wrong with that. And if this is like the base game, then I don't think cold and toxic resist is going to play a role in companions. Companions are immune to a lot of stuff in the base game, but they wouldn't have to wear gas masks. They're immune to toxic damage and radiation, stuff like that. So I'm not going to bother with that quite yet. I think we we'll us go ahead and save the rest of our skill points for now. Let's talk to this guy. A stern-looking police officer is warming his hands before a burning barrel. He smiles widely and salutes you. You can't resist stopping to chat with such a friendly member of law enforcement. A comrade policeman, what can you tell me about Trudegrad? Why do you ask? I'm uh, just curious. Is that against the law? Well, no, I guess not. What was it you wanted to know? Tell me about Trudegrad. If you don't know Trudegrad, I recommend you keep an eye on the signs. You can easily get lost if you're not familiar with the street names. Hmm. Could you tell me more about this street? It's mostly home to middle class citizens. A peaceable, educated people. Mostly. But I strongly advise go against going to the scrap quarter and beyond. Especially at night. That part of the city is controlled by gangs and troublemakers. I see. By the way, I'm looking for one of the residents. Professor Goryachev. Never heard of him. Professor who? Gorichev? No. Never call anyone by that name. But how's work? It's so cold lately. I'm doing my best to stay warm. As you can see, I haven't resorted to burning trash in a barrel. The smoke is intoxicating, but at least I'm warm. Alright, well, that wasn't very insightful. A heavy set, 40 ish fellow greets you with a sad sigh. Hello and welcome to Verkhanov's Print House, some of the cult classic periodical Grandma's Secrets. Unfortunately, we no longer offer subscriptions. It's gotten way too dangerous. Subscribing to a magazine is dangerous? How come? I can see you're not an avid reader of Grandma's Secrets. If you were, you'd already know about my predicament from articles like Print House Courier Attacked by Capybara's Gang, uh, Grandma's Secrets Under Siege. Another courier attacked by Theophilus Kapibarov, and so on. Or you might have read my editorial. The bloody price of safety. King leader Kapibarov demands money for safe passage of Grandma Secret's couriers on his street. Editor begs good Samaritans for help. That uh, sounds terrible, so how can I help? Let me show you where to find the man. Well, that's a strange map you've got there. Is it electronic? Hope gadgets like this don't replace good old fashioned paper anytime soon. It'd drive me out of business overnight. He laughs weakly and points at a spot on the screen. The gang controls a few blocks between here and the scrap quarter. Please, tell them to stop harassing my couriers, or you know, kill them. I'll pay you handsomely. Uh, what's your beef with this capybara uh, character? I have neither beef nor veal with this ruffian. The darn opportunist spotted my couriers traveling through his territory and started demanding a toll for safe passage. I know what kind of world we live in. If you ask for a ruble per trip, I consider it. But two? That's just plain crazy. A subscription to Grandma's Secrets costs 50 rubles per year. Do the math. How much are you willing to pay for my help? 
A few weeks ago, I decided to buy a weapon for protection. I don't know if the merchant was trying to trick me or there was a miscommuni miscommunication. But set up a gun, end up with a firearms modification kit or something. I'm no expert in these things. I'm sure someone like you will find it useful. I uh, got it. Can we change the subject now? Uh, what else can I do to help? I still have some questions. You don't mind. Questions are easy. They don't make me any money. They don't lose me money either. Uh, what can you tell me about your job? With the local bandits extorting me for my courier's safety, I won't be able to continue for long. If only one of the city's factions would help us out. But do they care to? Nope. No one does. And how much do you earn? Are you kidding? I can barely afford meat en afford meat ends. <laughs> uh, what can you tell me about Trudegrad? Uh, the city of chaos and lawlessness is what it is. When the tram still worked, it was livable. But now, if my business fails, I'll be leaving that same day. I'd be better off living in some small village, surrounded by nature. Uh, care to share any rumors? Uh, what good is hearsay? So it's, I'll share some sad truth instead. Did you know that people who read books are minority in Trudegrad? I wonder if the authorities still blame the chaos of the 90s for this disaster. That decade has become a tired old scapegoat for these, for those lazy bones. Uh, do you maybe want something printed? Not at the moment, I gotta go. He has a whole complex to loot. This printing press looks really ancient. It's a printing press. Oh, a handmade pistol magazine. We'll probably use that to uh, upgrade. Exigen's current pistol. In fact, what does my current upgrade on my knife do? Plus 5% chance to ignore armor, plus 35 to weapon skill requirement, and plus 3 melee damage. Pretty good. And let's see. The Handmade Pistol Magazine. Uh, this do-it-yourself magazine allows you to load additional 7 rounds. It is used with pistols and SMGs. So, so plus 7 to magazine size, plus 10% jamming chance, and plus 10 to weapon skill requirement. Don't think that's worthwhile. Blind where oh eight. That holds eight shots. Holds eight. It might be worth it for one of the um the automatic pistols. Might be worth buying. 
I give it to Hexagen. I don't know what his uh, technology score is, though. Alright, let's talk to this guy. Uh, the stupid craftsman is nailing a new soul to her worn-out boot. Without looking up from his work, he shouts out, First of all, speak up. I'm a deaf invalid, after all. And second, I want to get those shoes fixed up. Uh, not necessary. These boots are brand new. Is there any other service you can offer? The man pulls out a cardboard box with a tube of shoe polish, a couple of brushes, and a dirty rag from under his stool. See this? It can also shine your shoes. But that'll be 30 rubles. Expensive. But shiny boots are a rare luxury. I have money. Here. The shoe repairman gets to work. As soon as your tired old boots begin to shine. Uh, by the way, how did you lose your hearing? What? Ah, hee hee. You tell me. It roars and rumbles so that after the first shift, half the youngster's eardrums burst. The only way to escape from this thing is to drown yourself. Uh, deduce the correct answer based on your experiences surviving in the wastes. After a couple minutes thought, you decide the creature in question must be the marine analog of the desert worm Ogoi Quirkoi, the notorious Oyo Hoi Underdeck Worm Boy. <laughs> what? Your counterpart responds to this guess with a burst of laughter. Ha ha ha, of course not. I spent 20 years in the engine room of a cargo ship, went deaf right by the engine itself. Traveled all the way from Paragon to Royu no Okama, so I did. We even considered sailing to America to see how they were doing out there. The weather wasn't too good. After that, I became a boot fixer upper instead. And polish my boots, man. I uh, gotcha. Now let me ask you a few questions. A question isn't a dog. A piece of meat can't distract it. Uh, what's your name? What did you say? Oops, a hand around one ear. Uh, what's my name? Yes, I suppose I'll have to in introduce myself. Glenn Petrovich. Uh, what do you do for a living? I'm a repairman of sorts. Not for tech, but for clothes. I patch up shoes, boots, even belts. No matter how many times you ask, I'll still be this, not some other profession. Uh, what can you tell me about the city? About what? The city? I ain't got no grief with it. Ever take a gander at the roads around here? Folks ruin their shoes on the broken concrete much faster than in any, in any rural area. Where do they bring them when they're busted? That's right, yours truly. Uh, do you have any rumors to share? What the heck is a bottle of boomers? Ah darn. A couple of rumors. I have one. A guy once told me about the bloodthirsty pirate named Nemez, who anchored his ship clo close outside Trudegrad. He's a juju man of some renown, they say. He won't rest until he has his revenge on our poor little Berg. Uh, what did you say? Put your hands around your mouth. I have to go. See you soon. Actually, let's sell a couple of things to him. I won't steal from you. I'll probably grab the stuff in the kitchen. With a slight change of clothes. Oh, stop walking around, man. Of course, he's gonna sit down. Let's talk to him. A middle-aged man produces a dry smile as you come closer. You get the impression he's been waiting for you. Hello, you did to kill Print House, right? Bryce has started working on a new book, so you're in for a very exciting interview. Son, are you are you really working for this very influential magazine? And you're going to interview some wino while the gray-headed genius of Soviet literature has been at your side all this time. Oh Brutus, oh Pavel Morozov. Sorry, mister. I didn't quite catch that. Are you coming to the interview as well? It's actually you I wanted to talk to. 
I have a few questions. Are you serious? Me? Wow, that's new. So your magazine wants to know more about the man behind the Great Rider. Haha, uh -huh, just kidding. This has nothing to do with your wife. I just want to ask you a few general questions. You seem like a good guy. So sure, I'm listening. Uh, what's your name? My name's Givorg. Uh, what do you do? I'm like a press secretary for my wife, Risa. At least that's what it used to be called. She writes about Romaine, and I speak with reporters and try to gin up sales of her books. Now, what can you tell me about Trudigrad? This is a nice progressive city. You can still make money from your art, like in the good old days. Men who work for their wives are not frowned upon. What else can I say? It's a great place to live. And what are people talking about around here? These guys living nearby, you never guess what they do. They're watchmakers. Such a rare profession these days. They spend their days and nights tinkering with pre-war watches. You hear the ticking from across the yard. Great fellows, too. I see. Now let's talk about something else. Yes, let's arrange the interview. Bryce is very interested in sharing the details of her upcoming book with your readers. Okay, I'll interview your wife. Now let's quickly go over the rules. You'll be all set. First off, no personal questions. Nothing concerning her love life. Second, don't call her by her pen name. Uh, Daryal Raksh Ryski. During the interview, call her Risa. Third. Uh, listen without interrupting. Third, I recommend discussing her latest works. Saving Private Romain. From Gypsy with Love. And of course, the book she's working on now. The Gypsy and the Senorita. Fifth, or fourth rather. Ahem. I need to ask a personal favor. Will you hear me out? Uh, that's an interesting twist. Go on. The writer's husband closes his eyes and pinches the bridge of his nose. Okay, it might sound stupid at first, but I'm dying to know upon whom Risa based her protagonist remain. This heroic villain, this fiery, brow flirting filibuster with a heart of gold. Of course, I understand it's fiction. But Risa depicts his adventures, erotic and otherwise, so vividly that I'm sure he must be modeled on a real person. The novel Gypsy Kiss has a love scene where Romain calls out the name of his heart's desire, Risa, even though the female protagonist is called Florizelda. She refuses to reveal the source of her inspiration, saying so it would kill the character's masculine mystique. But perhaps she might let it slip during an interview. Please help me. Find out who the Gypsy Baron's prototype, or who is the Gypsy Baron's prototype. You have a real talent for circling around the issue. You're worried she's cheating on you, right? You have to be so crass? I don't think I'm going to sleep tonight, but, well, the answer is yes. That's why I want to know. If my marriage falls apart, it'll be the end of me. I have to know. Okay, I'll find out what I can. Say goodbye to uncertainty. Maybe. Thank you so much. The man calls his wife from where she's bent over her desk. Risa, dear. The reporter is here. He's going to interview you, just like we wanted. Just imagine your sales going up, up, up. We talk to Risa. Now she'll hear you out. Well, let's see what happens. I'm uh, writing something in a pre war notebook with quill and ink. The woman whispers. How about you cross this palm of silver, you bastard? Jatsky barked while lunging at Romaine with a broken shovel handle. Hmm. Sorry, I'm in the middle of my writing just now. Let's talk later. Oh, would you look at this woman? I composed my best lines while being tortured in a forced labor logging camp, in the cancer ward, while being crucified, while they were turning me into a devil. And you cannot spare a couple of minutes to talk to this kid. Yes, yes, I've heard it a million times, Trudov. I have my own process, and I can't allow myself to be distracted. I'm here about the interview. You have a minute. Risa looks up blinking from her illegible writing, and a kind smile blossoms on her face. Oh right, I get so caught up in my own thoughts that the world around me ceases to exist. But I'm willing to make an exception for you. You're from Shoot to Kill Print House, right? How can you print a house and who is getting shot? What an interesting sense of humor you have, comrade. I see. To further elaborate on your joke, you didn't even bring a notebook or a recorder. Don't tell me you're going to rely on memory. I'll come up with something. Worst case scenario, I'll store everything up here in the old melon. 
Bryson winks at you, giggling. One should always praise oneself when the opportunity arises. Fine. Let's assume I believe you. You look like a person of extraordinary talent. Will this interview be as extraordinary as you are? I prefer spontaneity to plans. Let's just chat and see where this conversation leads us. I like the sound of that. The best conversations happen in a friendly, relaxed atmosphere. Yeah, how we get started? We start uh, wherever you want. And tell you about my literary past, my most scandalous works, and the universe of my Gypsy Odyssey series. And of course, I'd like to say a few words about my newest book. Or perhaps you have something else in mind. Just go ahead and ask. Uh, let's discuss your past. How did you become a writer? To be honest, I always wanted to be an author. For as long as I can remember, I've been writing silly poems, about love of course. But I always wanted to write something deeper, mix genres, and make plots intertwine. What better setting for a thrilling, brutal, yet romantic, and sometimes funny series than The Gypsy Odyssey? By the age of 20, I created the protagonist Romain, and the universe he lives in. Now, which of your books is the most scandalous? The book I co-wrote with Kanganovich, it was called The Baron vs. The Barbarian, where the characters of our books had to face each other in deadly combat. However, they reconciled, and we learned that their mothers share the same first name <laughs> oh, Batman vs. Superman. This plot twist confused a lot of people. It was widely seen as meaningless. Alas. Let's not forget my other white hot white hot work, it's hard to say. Uh, the gypsy that crossed my palm. There, Remain's mother, Ramona, predicts an attack from Siema Vranok, the tyrant of the north, which results in the destruction of Trudegrad. However, the head of the secret police. Major Von Skandrelhoff, Skandrelhoff does not believe her and banishes all the gypsies from the city. Then the prophecy comes true. The expulsion of his people doesn't affect how Romain feels about the ordinary citizens of Trudegrad. When Sioma starts his invasion with an attack on an orphanage in the city center, our hero jumps on a stolen horse and tramples the enemy to death. In the following celebration, the grateful crowd literally tears Von Skandrelhoff to pieces. Hmm. What are you working on now? I'm so glad you asked. I'm writing a sequel to my most commercially successful book, Big Trouble with Little Gypsy Camp 2. <laughs> As you know, in the previous book, Remain defeats his twin brother, Neomor, with the Gypsy King Dagger. But three years later, his camp is flooded with poisonous moonshine produced by a mysterious merchant. The only clue to his identity is the same dagger that is sticking out of his left eye. Will a proud nomad be able to defeat an enemy that's risen from the dead? Or maybe they will form an unlikely alliance and become partners in crime. Or perhaps our hero will squander his energy arguing with his shrew of a bride-to-be, Marianne. Or maybe the brother of his father's sister's son, the young and dangerous Chatsky, will return from Egypt with an army of Neo-Mamluks to challenge Romain for his title as Baron. Now what inspired you to write the Gypsy Odyssey? What is your obsession with these adventurous types? I don't know. It's just an interesting subject. Some people read my books because of Romaine, others for the epic battles. In my books, where a guitar ballad serenading extraordinary beauties is followed by ruthless gunfights with enraged paraplegics, everybody can find something to enjoy. Have you ever wanted to write about Adam? Excuse me, what? Never heard of it. I see. Alright. They've got enough material for now. Marissa eyes you suspiciously. Do you? It seemed rather short. Well, maybe I can offer your readers some exclusive information about this series. You could reveal who the heroic Romain is based on. That's something everyone is dying to know. Oh no, I have to keep my fans guessing. If they find out all my secrets, they might lose interest. Oh come on, I'm curious. As is everyone else, I guarantee it. Fine. I wonder, why do I find you so charming? I'm an adventurous type, I'm, I'm her, uh, her type. Alright, you want to know who Romain is based on? My husband, Gavorg. That's it. That's the truth. Really? How such a tough character come to be modeled after your husband? You just don't know him very well. To me, that man is a hero. I grew up in a village near Astrakhan. My father was very strict. He blamed the war and the collapse of the country on everyone who wasn't exactly like him. Since Gavorg was a refugee from a badly bombed region, 
My father hated him at once. He used to interrupt our dates and intercept our love letters. He swore to kill Gavorg if he ever saw him in the village. That's why we began plotting our escape. It seemed impossible, just a fantasy. Until one momentous night, when I heard the thudding of hooves outside my window. I looked outside, and it was my Gavorg. He was wearing his best jacket, and riding my father's horse, Turnip. He silently offered me his hand, and helped me up into the saddle. And when the Trudegrad and then the Trudegrad rode, dust bloating in my face, my heart trembling. I remember that night forever. When I started the Gypsy Odyssey, I wanted to preserve this memory and base the main character on my heroic husband. I try to be subtle about it. When I write Romaine, I'm always thinking of my beloved Kavorg. Well, what do you know? Thanks for the story. Now, thank you for listening. Feel free to come by again. You're a weird guy. That's usually the case with creative types. Stop. Make me blush. Salute the woman and leave. I rise to the writer turns her soulful gaze on you and smiles kindly. Hi. I heard a long talk last time you came by. What brings you back? Uh, nothing much. Uh, could you answer a couple questions for me? Another interview? Alright. Uh, so how are you doing? So far so good. A magnum opus is called Big Trouble in Little Gypsy Camp 2. Of course, I'll never be as famous as Agatha Christie, but I'm sure as heck outshine the likes of Gubstov and Trudov. <laughs> oh sure you do. Keep your dreams, darling. They're harmless enough. I'm like a bullet between the eyes from an insulted, elderly, perhaps slightly crazed author. That would actually be quite harmful. Really disastrously harmful. Pow pow. Comrade Trudov, if you'd shot me as many times as you've threatened me, there wouldn't be a bullet left in the city. Now uh, what can you tell me about your husband? I love him. What else is there to say? Without him, I'd have no ad campaigns, no success, no fans of my book series, The Gypsy Odyssey. And how do you like life in Trudegrad? Do you know any other place where a person is able to just sit down and write and make some money at the same time? Despite the nuclear war, despite the fact that half of half the country has been overrun by literal barbarians, moving to Trudegrad was the best decision my husband and I ever made. Have you heard any interesting rumors lately? I heard that some Black Lotus dealer was arrested at the scrap quarter. Well, but what's arresting one dealer in the grand scheme of things? A drop of water in a storm-tossed sea. A drug is slowly poisoning our city. Nobody is doing anything to stop it. Alrighty then, I better get going. The man who charged you with interviewing his wife, Risa, holds his arms and asks hopefully, Have you been able to learn anything about the model for Romain, a gypsy baron extraordinaire? Uh, yes, I did find something out. Oh, what did you find out? It turns out Romaine is based on you. The time you abducted her from her father's house was her very first inspiration. The man's eyes well up with emotion, and his cheeks flush a healthy red. Hand over his heart, he speaks in a husky whisper. All this time I thought Romaine was based on some ex, or God forbid, current lovers. But it was a story but it was a story of our love. Yes, now I understand. I stole a horse from her father, that tyrant and rescued her from the farm. She included that same scene in Ballad of a Gypsy. I just didn't realize she had swapped the horse for a tank and her brutal father for the chief of a rival gypsy camp. She really does love me. She's loved me this whole time. And not only that, but to her I am fantastically attractive, passionate young hero. Um, are you alright, man? I'm better than alright. I'm Romaine. All these years, all her books were about me. This is how Risa sees me. I'm going to dedicate myself to living up to her vision. Yeah, yeah. But who's going to pay me? Also remain? Ah, yes. Here, Road Warrior. Take 100 rubles and these medicines. As a nomad of the wasteland, I can assure you they'll come in handy on your adventures. Uh, that ain't much, is it, brother? Okay, Road Warrior. The wisdom of long experience, this old gypsy will throw in 200 more rubles and an extra med kit, or medical kit. Happy now? Uh, nice doing business with you, uh, Romaine. The man gives you 300 rubles, two medical kits, several syringes loaded with chemicals, and uh, three tins of stewed meat. Uh, this is for you, Gajo. Gajo is what we gypsies call anyone without Roma blood. Like you. And I am a gypsy. That's what my right, 
That's what my wife wrote in her book. If you say so, buddy. Okay, I gotta go. Now. Alright. I'll loot this person's apartment, and then we'll speak to them in the next one. Well, there's three people in there, actually. They still see me. Okay. Well, it was worth a shot. Alright, I'm gonna call the episode here. The next one will speak to the... I was just calling them... Say that they're not their, her children. Well, I'm not gonna say family. These NPCs next time. And then we'll continue through the rest of these apartments. Probably wrap it up. underground area. I thought it was right here. Nope, that was a different area, I think. Or is it right here? Darn it. One of these areas had a... Uh... Answer to the like, took us underground somewhere. Was it... um? wasn't in the docks, was it? Didn't I come here from the docks? What is this? Interact with this real fast. Right over there. Because we're here now. The tavern that has the underground area? Might be the tavern. I swore it was called Tushkin Street that had it. But I don't see it. Wait, what's this? Oh, it's that uh, symbol. The trumpet with the, uh, the cork in it. For the uh, the secret cartel. All right, we call the episode here. Our next one will continue speaking to people on Color Tushkin Street. Uh, potentially wrap it up. I think maybe not. There's a ton of people in here. Looks like this apartment's empty. So, either way, thanks for watching. Hope to see you guys in the next one.